I'm actually excited about teaching the principles this week uh, for the, this reason. I've had the privilege of teaching them as a refresher in churches around the country. I've been doing this traveling thing for 17 years now. And uh, I've actually found churches grasp the principles more the second time than the first time. The first time, they're like, wow, we've never even seen that before. I've never noticed that in the Word before. And it's kind of eye-opening and they begin to start making some traction. But a lot of churches have done what Dave and the elders have asked me to do and come and just do a refresher because it's actually during the refresher that it really starts to sink in. And I'm kind of excited about that and look forward to being with you uh, tomorrow night and Tuesday as well. But what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at one aspect of it that I have not taught here before. So this morning won't be a refresher for anybody it might be something you've never, ever noticed before in God's Word. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, this is Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let's pray together. Father, as we dive into what you have me to, uh, to preach this morning, I thank you for the fact that you've opened my eyes to these things and you've called me to communicate them. But Lord, I also understand fully that if anyone is going to be able to grasp these truths, it's got to be done by your Spirit. It's not by human wisdom. It's, been, it's received by humbling ourselves and allowing you to teach us. And Lord, I also know that I can't communicate it in such a way that if I word it just right, then they'll get it. Lord, if people grasp it, it's because you have spoken through me. And that's what I want that to be the case this morning. I pray that you would take control of my heart and my mind and my lips. And Lord, that what you would have us look at today, what you would have us grasp would be what comes out of my mouth. And I thank you for this privilege that I've been given and that the, also I understand that it's a responsibility and I yield myself to you. I thank you again for what you're going to do because everything you do is good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look closely at what this story tells us here. Jesus was walking along the shore. He sees some guys fishing. We're going to look at this story some more later on in this message from other uh, angles. But look closely at what Jesus says. He says two things. He says, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. What should have been their focus, according to that? Following Jesus. Listen to what he said. He said, your focus should be following me. I will make you fishers of men. You follow me. What we've done, unfortunately, in the churches over the years, is we've made evangelism our focus. You ever notice that pretty much what we're taught all the time is the focus on evangelism and telling people about Jesus and focusing on evangelism and making sure we get the message out? I, I want to take you back in your minds. And actually, if you want to double check me, go ahead to Acts chapter 2. Look at Acts chapter 2. Look at verses 42 through 47. This is right after Peter has been filled with the Spirit and controlled by the Spirit to preach at Pentecost. In verse 42, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and they, this is the people that just believed the 3,000 souls that were baptized and added to the number, they devoted themselves, you're going to notice, to four things. One, the apostles' teaching. Two, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. We're going to talk about that later this week in the getting back to biblical fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. And by the way, in this passage, that means prayer. I mean, the Lord's Supper. And they devoted themselves to a fourth thing, prayer. So look closely. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper. And they devoted themselves to prayers. Evangelism isn't one of the four things they focused on. Actually, if you go on and keep reading, when you get to verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Isn't that interesting? They didn't even focus on evangelism. They focused on the Word of God. They focused on being together. They focused on why they were together in the Lord's Supper, and they focused on praying. And when that was their focus, the church grew. We've been taught to focus on evangelism. 
And some of you, if you've walked with the Lord for any length of time, there's been something in your spirit even that's been saying, Why? something doesn't seem right. You don't dare say anything because, I mean, you'd look like a bad Christian. I'm going to show you scripturally. Stick with me here. Don't, 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 don't run off the tracks just yet. I'm going to show you that actually you will see more people come to faith in Jesus Christ as you learn to walk with Jesus. Because as you're going to see, the scripture shows us that as we follow him, he's the one who orchestrates our appointments. He's the one that sets up our encounters. And he's the one who's already gone ahead of us in each of those situations to set the, to prepare the soil. We have tried to go out and reach people for Jesus, and we're trying to get people saved that God hasn't even gotten them to that point yet. That's why when Jesus told his disciples, go out two by two, he said, as you go, let your peace go out, but if it's received, stay there. If not, move on. I'm not at work there. And we had to learn to walk with Jesus. Actually, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Those of you that know your Bibles and know the letters of Paul, when Paul wrote to the churches, how many people did he ever say, uh, how many times did he write to a church and say, how many are you running? What's your attendance? Never did, did he? You ever notice Paul never said, what's your attendance now? Yet, isn't that what pastors do when we greet each other? Or people even ask about your church, well, how many are you guys running? Because we've been taught to measure on focusing on growing the church, church growth. We judge our pastors and whether or not the church is growing or shrinking. But that was never going to be the focus. Jesus said, follow me. I'll take care of all the other stuff. And you're going to see throughout this weekend that God wants us to get back to walking with him. By the way, I'm going to ask you another question. In all of Paul's letters to the church, even Peter and anybody else that wrote to the churches, let me ask you, how many times did they say, how many of you reached for Christ? Never did. Actually, if you look at the scriptures, Paul would write these things, Peter as well. They would say, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love toward all the saints. Here's my prayer for you, that your faith in the Lord would grow and that your love for each other would grow. As you focus on walking with Jesus, if you focus on the Word of God and knowing how to let the Spirit of God through His Word teach you about Him and how to follow Jesus, and as you focus on loving each other, and by the way, the book of Hebrews says, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You ever notice that in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, it talks about our boldness to approach the throne of grace, and then it says in verse 24, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but all the more as you see the day approaching, yet we're living in a day and age in which people are starting to become less and less willing to get together because of COVID and all these other issues and all this stuff. I'm glad some of you are able to follow along right now and are able to, because that's the amazing blessing that this technology has given us. Uh, it has expanded our ministry unbelievably. Our ministry has exploded because of Facebook and different things like that and YouTube and things. But let me just say this. If you're using this as an excuse not to be here when you could be here, the Bible says don't do it. And all the more we need to spend time together as we see the day approaching. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to take you back into some of the passages that have been used over the years to try to guilt us into telling more people about Jesus and show you what they really said in the context. And you may be shocked. Go with me to Matthew chapter 16. This is just setting the stage for where we're going to be going tonight. Sorry, not tonight, tomorrow night and Tuesday night. This is just going to set the stage on the importance of getting back to following Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, we'll start in verse 15. And Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? He's already asked them, who do other people say that I am? But he said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, the profession of your faith, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Look at the next verse. It's going to surprise you. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) Peter just got the right answer. First off, by the way, notice what Jesus said when Peter got the right answer. He said, man didn't open your eyes. God opened your eyes. It wasn't done by man. It was done by God. Secondly, look at what he says next. He says, "Um, now don't tell anybody. 
We would automatically think that Jesus would say, okay, you got the right answer now, go tell everybody. But Jesus strictly charged them not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. As you're going to see, it's because the Bible is very clear that God determines where we go and when we go. What we say and what we don't say. When we speak, when we don't speak. And when we learn how to follow Him, we actually see God accomplish more because He's the Lord of the harvest. And we're going to talk about that passage in just a second. We've got to learn how to walk with Jesus, how to hear Jesus. And by the way, it's going to be on Tuesday night. I'm going to explain to you on Tuesday night how to know that God's speaking, how to recognize the voice of God, how to recognize when he's leading and when he's not leading. You'll, I will teach you on all that from the scriptures. I'm going to show you that on Tuesday night. But we need to become people that follow Jesus, not Christians who try to live a good life and try to do what the Bible says, but actually learn how to listen to the Spirit of God. As you're going to see when we get to tomorrow night, one of the principles is how God doesn't duplicate a method and how nowhere in Scripture does He ever do the exact same thing the exact same way twice. I'm going to show you that from the Scriptures, but let me just say this to you. I was preaching on that one time at a at a pastor's conference down in the Miami area, and this man came up to me during one of the breaks, one of the pastors, and he said, he goes, I, I can't argue with what you're saying, but I got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, I was taught that you just take a passage of Scripture and you see how Jesus did it or see how Paul did it, and you just tell everybody that's how you do it. I go, the problem with that, though, is in one instance, Jesus did it this way, and in another instance, it looks very similar, Jesus did it a different way. In Matthew 15, Jesus offends the Pharisees and the disciples come to him and they say, don't you realize what you said offended the Pharisees? And he said, who cares? They're blind leaders that are blind. Let them go. Yet, have you ever thought about the fact that when Jesus said, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He wasn't standing on a hill with his arms open. It was one-on-one in the dark with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. So how do you treat the Pharisees? Do you just let them go? Or do you reach out to them in love? You've got to learn how to take the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit's direction on how to apply these truths. And that has been lost in the church. Because we've got our systems, we've got our formulas, we've all even broken down into our different denominations. As the, we do it this way and you do it your way. and We find our little groups and we judge each other on whether or not we're doing it the right way. And we've lost how to walk with Jesus. I'm going to be speaking this afternoon to the elders and their wives and be praying for them. Because biblically, they need to be the ones who are following God even more and passing on how to follow God to y'all. If I've dealt with a lot of churches around the country on elder leadership and all, and I think the Bible teaches without question it's the biblical model. But I also say, if you think your job is to be a decision maker or just a leader, you're not ready to be an elder. An elder is someone who knows how to hear from God and walk with God, a spiritual man who prays, who recognizes the leadership of the Spirit, not swayed by public opinion, not worried about what everybody else thinks, but wants to follow God. And if you just think you're here to make sure that the church is keeping biblical and, and I'm going to make sure you're not an elder. An elder is someone who is spiritual enough to let all the craziness go on around and still hear from God. And that's my role. I come around, I travel in different churches around the country. I was in Phoenix last weekend. By the way, the weather was a little bit warmer in Phoenix last weekend. But my role is to help churches get back to recognizing the voice of God. Some of you guys might understand what I'm talking about. Those of you that like to listen to sports on the radio while you're driving, have you ever noticed while you were driving in the car, you're listening to a game, But as you keep driving, the signal starts to get a little fuzzy, and it gets a little staticky, and you're still tuning in. You know what I'm talking about. You're all feeling sorry for me because I don't have serious radio. But here's the deal. Your wife finally goes, would you just turn that off? It's driving me nuts. And you always say, not yet. They're about to score. You've learned how to tune out the other stuff and hear. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want to be used to God this weekend to help you learn how to tune out the other stuff and to hear God. So Jesus says, I'm in charge of when you go. Even though you've got the right answer, I determine when you share it and when you don't share it. Go to Matthew chapter 9. Let's take a look at another passage of Scripture that's been used to guilt us into doing better and doing more. Matthew chapter 9, look at verses 35 through 37. 
says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Now, I want honesty this morning. I want to show a hands. How many of you have had this passage taught or preached? And they said that Jesus was saying, the fields are widened to harvest. There's lots of people to be saved, but there's not enough workers. The, the laborers are few. Isn't that, show, isn't that what we've been taught? There's not enough workers. We need more workers. Isn't that what we've been taught? Well, stop for a second. I want you to always examine everything you ever hear a preacher or a teacher say against the whole of Scripture. Let me ask you a question. Does that interpretation of that passage match up with the rest of Scripture? Does the rest of Scripture teach us that Jesus is limited by how many people are working? No. It's the exact opposite. Acts chapter 17, verse 25, Paul says to the Areopagus on Mark Hill, he says, listen, he said, God's not served by human hands if he needed anything. Jesus rode into Jerusalem and his disciples were praising and the Pharisees said, tell them to stop. He said, if they stop, what? The rocks will cry out. Jesus, uh, God, but it's Jesus, I mean, he's God, takes Gideon, helps him round up 32,000 men to fight the Midianites. And by the way, the Bible says the Midianites were so numerous you couldn't count their camels. That's how many Midianites there were. And God has Gideon round up 32,000, and then he says to him, hey, you got too many now. Tell anybody that's afraid to go home. 22,000 say thank you very much. And they leave. He's down to 10,000. And God says, you still have too many. And he narrows it down to just 300 with no weapons, just trumpets and torches. Is God limited by how many people are working? No. No. Actually, if you had been reading your Bibles, you would have known that Jesus, just a few chapters before, had said something with that exact same word, few. Go go back to Matthew. Keep a finger here in Matthew 9. Go back to Matthew chapter 7. Look at verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by that gate are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are what? Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Those who find it are what? Few. So what Jesus says here is the actual amount of people that are really going to be saved in comparison to the rest of the world is a small number. By the way, that blows up all the preaching we've heard, how the Christians are going to change the world for Christ and we're going to have this massive revival You hear that kind of preaching? There's going to be a massive revival, and we're praying for this massive revival. Jesus actually said, narrows the road that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find it. Luke 18, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus in John chapter 15 tells his disciples, oh, by the way, the world hated me. They're going to hate you. We need to be understanding that this is God's plan, this is God's work, and we're to just be following Him and what He's doing in the world. And so Jesus had just said in Matthew 7, the amount of people that are actually going to be saved is a small number. It's few. Now in Matthew 9, He says this. He says, the fields are white unto harvest, but the amount of laborers we're starting with is a small number. Not that we need more. The number we're starting with is a small number. Therefore... Because we've got a small number in comparison to the rest of the globe, pray, seek the Lord of the harvest, the one who's in charge of the harvest, that he would send out laborers into his harvest field. The best way I can illustrate it to you is this. Let's just say you own a ranch. And by the way, when I was in Phoenix, I actually went to some guy's uh, place and uh, uh, he was, we we're going to go golfing, but he, I had to be dropped off at his ranch. And I don't know how many acres, 80,000. 80, it was a big, big ranch. Can you imagine if you owned a ranch, say you had 80,000 acres, and you had a small crew of workers that were there to work, because he had people that worked for him to run that ranch. Let's just say you had a small crew, and you can get your work done with that small crew. You don't want that small crew getting up every morning and going off to do whatever they thought you might want them to do. You would rather they come and meet with you every morning and say, what's our assignment today? Would you not? 
I mean, you're the Lord of the ranch. You're in charge of the whole thing, and you've got the master plan. And you would say to them, today, we're going to go work on fences on the back 40 because the fences are, need to be repaired because tomorrow we're getting some more cattle and the fences have got to be fixed before we get the cattle. In the same way, that's why we are daily to learn how to walk with Jesus. Lord, where would you have me be today? I'm not going to have a plan to go try to reach people for you today. I want to walk with you. You set my appointments. You set my schedule. And if you have appointments for me, by the way, if you notice, that's how Jesus lived his life. When he was in the flesh, he only did what he saw his father having him do. By the way, weren't there a lot of people that expected Jesus to do a lot of things? But he said, no, I only do what the father has me do. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, he gets up early in the morning and he goes off to pray, and the disciples wake up, and they can't find him, and they go find him, and they say, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus says, let's go to the next town. You, you can double check me. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 and following. He said, let's go to the nearby towns and villages. Wait a minute, Jesus. Everybody here is looking for you. The door's open. Actually, I just spent some time with the Father, and he said, it's time for me to head to the next town. Acts chapter 8. Philip is in Samaria. Great revival breaks out in Samaria. Simon the sorcerer gets saved. All these people are burning all their witchcraft stuff. Number of people are coming to faith. And God says to Philip, I want you to leave the revival. And I want you to head down this desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And as he's on his way to Gaza, the spirit has him go over to a chariot where God had already been at work. And he set Philip's appointment. And the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. Well, our problem, though, is, is we, without realizing it, have taken over God's plan to reach the world. We think it's up to us. I want to show a hands here as well. How many of you ever heard the preacher's quote from Matthew 24, verse 14, where it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world, and then the end will come. Therefore, as soon as we get the gospel to the whole world, then the end will come. You ever heard that one too? Problem with that is, that first of all doesn't match up with the whole of Scripture. That says that the gospel hasn't been preached to the whole world yet, right? Which, one, means there have been generations of people that never had a chance to be saved, which doesn't match up with the scripture. Secondly, Colossians chapter 1 verse 23, Paul says, this gospel which has been preached in all creation. Romans chapter 1 says gospel has been preached through creation and what's been made so men are without excuse Romans chapter 2 he goes on and says that even if people didn't hear God's written law and his law of God he wrote his law in their hearts to their consciences and then he makes this interesting statement in chapter 2 of Romans verse 16 he says God will judge all men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares Romans chapter 10 right after that passage which says how can they hear unless someone preaches to them and we've just turned that into if we don't tell them they may never hear that's not what the passage is saying because if you keep reading he's actually been saying this he said God would never expect anyone to believe something he hadn't already told them and then he asked this question in verse 18. Have they not heard? Of course they have. His word has gone out into all the earth. Folks, God doesn't need you. He's not sitting back saying, as soon as Momentum Christian Church would just do what they're supposed to do, then that area around them would get reached. No. Let me tell you something. Jesus back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, made an interesting statement. You might not have caught it. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I need a show of hands again. How many of you have heard people talking about how the church is dying and the church is sick? You ever heard that one? Is, yeah. God's church is fine. Take it from a traveling preacher. I'm in different churches around the country every week. I get to see God at work all over. Let me say something to you. The church is fine. The real church, God is doing his work, and that church is fine. Now, individual congregations might not be looking too good, but that's because a lot of individual congregations have redesigned what they think church should be, and they're more comfortable in keeping what they have in mind instead of following God. Let me just tell you straight up, folks, a lot of church plants get all excited. We're going to not be like that old traditional church. We're going to be a new church plant. We're not going to do all the old stuff they used to do. We're going to be new and fresh. Within two years, you're going to become a traditional church. 
you're just going to have different traditions. You're going to have the things you like and the things you do. And that whole idea of following God gets lost. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The question is, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want God to use you guys here? You don't need new strategies and new formulas. You need how to learn how to go back to following Jesus and saying, Lord, what would you have individually us do? And as a group, what would you have us do now? And then be ready for him to change it. Because he's more interested in you following him than it is in you being comfortable in your traditions. Go to Luke chapter 5. Let's go back to this re- this. Jesus calling his disciples. Luke brings out a little bit more in this account that will help us. In Luke chapter 5, look at verses 1 through 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, on Jesus, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. Now getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Listen to what Peter says. Simon answered, Master, we fished all night and took nothing. By the way, Does that sound like a few evangelism strategies of our churches today? Man, we've been fishing and fishing and fishing, and we're not catching any. (coughs) Excuse me. But then he says this. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with them, Simon and Jesus. uh, Sorry, partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought the boats into land, they left everything and followed him. Listen to what happened here. Jesus says to Peter, after he's been in his boat, he says, hey, let's throw out the nets for a catch. Peter says, look, you don't know how this stuff works, Jesus. We fish at night because the fish can't see the net at night. You fish in the day, the fish can see the net. It's not how it works. Lord, we've got it already all figured out. Buddy, do we do that to the Lord now? We think we got how God saves all figured out. And we fight with each other over how God saves you got your Calvinists and your Arminians and all these different groups because we are smarter than God, even though Jesus himself in John chapter, sorry, uh, yeah, John chapter 3, verse 8 told Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wills and you don't know where it's going or where it's coming from and so it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Yet we think we can figure things out. And once we figure them out, we don't need to check with God anymore because we already know how to do it. And we've been doing this church thing for 2,000 years. We kind of got it down. We don't need to check with God anymore. But Peter was wise enough to say, even though this goes against everything I know and everything in me, because you say so, I'll do what you say to do, even though it ain't going to work and it's stupid. And all of a sudden they catch so many fish, they're embarrassed. Go to John 21. It's now been three years, and Jesus is going to have to give his disciples a refresher course, kind of like what's going on this weekend. John 21, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples. This is after he's died. This is after he's risen from the dead. He's appearing for 40 days. After this, he revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, another name for the Sea of Galilee, same, same lake. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. 
And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went and out and they got in the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Now, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they weren't able to haul in, haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they, got out on the, when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish on it, laid out in bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard, and he hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153, And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so would the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, look at this situation. Jesus, I'm going to show you, was standing. The scripture shows us this. was, Was sitting on the shore with a fire, watching them fish all night. And they knew he was there, they just didn't know it was him. I can prove it to you. How far from the shore was the boat? 100 yards. Football guys, what's that the length of? It's a football field. 100 yards is the length of a football field. Can you see the other side of a football field? Yes. You might not be able to recognize who that person is, but you can see 100 yards. What was the condition of the fire when they got to the shore? Charcoal. So how long had that fire been burning for it to be charcoal? It's been burning for a while. It, it, it has to burn for quite a while for it to become charcoal. So this story tells us that Jesus was sitting on the shore with his fire, watching it burn down slowly as he watched them fish all night. About daybreak, he gets up, and in the Greek, it, it actually reads this way. You don't got any fish, do you? How's that working out for you? And they said, it ain't. And he says, well, throw it on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Being fishermen who have been fishing all night using nets, don't you think they would have thrown it on the right, the left, the back, the front? And at this point, they don't even know it's Jesus. So they don't throw the net on the right side of the boat because they know it's Jesus. But they're at that point where they're so ready, they'll try anything. I hope you guys are at that point. I pray you're at that point where you're saying, Lord, whatever you have in mind, I'm ready to go. But many of us, unfortunately, aren't, don't get to that point. We're willing to say, hey, Lord, you know, I'm willing to hear your plan. If it matches up with my plan, I might be willing to do it. Now, you got to get to that point where you're saying, I really want whatever God I'm so ready for whatever God wants. That's when you're ready to hear him. Because you will not be able to hear God's voice and you will not be able to hear God's direction until you acknowledge what your will is. I'm going to make a statement that may shock you, but I'm going to prove to to you biblically. Jesus did not pray in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. What he prayed was this. Here's my will. Father, If there's any way you can remove this cup from me, if there's any way you can have mankind reconciled to you without me going to the cross, I'm for it. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Do you understand the difference? We just say, Lord, I just want whatever you want. And God goes, not really. And until you're willing to acknowledge your will, And lay it down, you won't be able to hear God's will and he won't reveal his will until he shows you what your will really is. And many times in our lives, he puts us in situations to get us to that point where we're willing to lay down what we had in mind. All right, Lord, what do you have in mind? I lay it down. Oh, I love this. Once the net gets so full of fish, John recognizes I know who that is now, because we didn't just do this. This is supernatural. And folks, 
When churches start to grow because God's doing it, you can't give any credit to your four spiritual laws or your evangelism explosion or your Christian witness training or all your strategies that you've been taught to go reach people for Jesus. It's a work that only God can do, and it's obvious God did it. Problem is, is too many of us would have been in that boat with those guys and written a book on how to throw the net on the right side of the boat. I love this even more. When they get to the shore, what does Jesus already have on the fire? Fish. He goes, oh, bring some of the stuff you caught too. In other words, I don't need you. I can get fish, but I'll use what I do through you. Folks, when I stand before God, I don't want to get to a point where I say, Lord, I did this for you and I did that for you. The Bible says there are going to be many that say, Lord, didn't we preach in your name and in your name cast out demons? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, I was doing the right things. I was doing the good church things. God, I was doing everything your word said to do. He goes, you weren't following me, I never knew you. Folks, I don't want that for anybody in this place. My prayer is that you ask God to help reschedule your schedule so you can be back here tomorrow night and on Tuesday and we can begin to really look at these principles and allow God to teach us again what does it mean to follow him because unfortunately Jesus says to the church in the last days the Laodicean church he says you think you're rich and have need of nothing yet you don't realize you're wretched pitiful, poor, blind and naked, all descriptions of the lost. And then he says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. If you were cold, I wish you were cold or hot. If you're cold, you'd realize you're cold and you'd understand your need for me. If you're hot, you'd be on fire for me. But because you're lukewarm, playing the game, you're about to find out I don't know you. Folks, we are so close to the return of Jesus for his church. It's time that we say, Lord, what do you have in mind? What if he moved you? Well, Jim, I was good with it until you said move. I mean, come on now. Listen, there was a farmer that had the preacher come visit. And the preacher said to the farmer, he said, if you had 100 pigs, would you give the church 50 of them? The farmer said, preacher, you know me, you know my heart for the church. If I had 100 pigs, I'd give the church 50. The preacher said, if you had uh, 50 pigs, would you give the church 25? Preacher, you know me, I love you, and I love the Lord, and I love the church. If I had 50 pigs, I'd give the church 25. The preacher said, if you had two pigs, would you give the church one? The preacher said, no, hang on now, preacher, you know I have two pigs. We're going to go from preaching to meddling this week. And really deal with honesty. Are you willing to go wherever he wants to go? I'm going to share a story with you as we close. That shows you how if you follow Jesus, he sets up appointments you could have never dreamed. I I could spend the rest of the week telling you stories of this. Because I've learned to walk with Jesus like this. And I could tell you story upon story upon story. Uh, But I'm just going to close with one. Years ago, I had the privilege of teaching 200 pastors in Thailand. They had heard about my book, The Eight Principles of a God-Centered Church. And they flew me to Thailand where they had 200 pastors from all over Thailand come to this Christian conference center and we spent the whole week with a translator. We ate together for breakfast. We ate together at the conference center for lunch and dinner. We all slept there. And for 200 pastors, I spent the whole week teaching them on a stage in front of 200 the principles of a God-centered church. Well, that first day, we go to our first meal and I sit down. There's rows of tables in the cafeteria, if you will, at this place. And across from me sits a young person in their 20s. They're dressed all in black. They've got piercings. They've got a haircut that I can't tell, and their body shape is such, I can't tell if I'm looking at a guy or a girl. I don't know if it's a male or a female. So I decided to find out, and I said, Hey, I'm Jim. What's your name? And the person said, Chris. I thought, that doesn't help me. But then... It was a he. He said, but I want you to call me beer. I said, beer as in the alcoholic drink? 
He goes, yes. I go, Chris, why do you want me to call you Beer? He said, my name is Chris, but all my friends call me Beer because that's what I live for. I said, Pat, uh, Beer, let me ask you a quick question. You're probably not one of the pastors here this week, are you? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I hope not. He goes, no, I'm not. I go, then what are you doing here? This is a conference for all these pastors to come hear me speak. He goes, I heard that an American was going to be speaking here this week, and I'm in college, and I'm learning English, and I decided I would come to this conference because I want to practice my English. So I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I'm going to sit here across from you at every meal, and wherever you go, I'm going to follow you because I want to practice my English. Now, I remember thinking to myself, you don't know what you just signed up for, buddy, but all right, buckle up, here we go. And I start to share the gospel with him, and he says, no, I did not come here to become a Christian. I came here to practice my English. And I have got to learn now how to let the Spirit of God show me when to speak, when not to speak, what to say, what not to say. Too many of us have been taught our strategies. No, 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 I've got to finish the last page of the tract. You didn't let me finish the tract. You know what I'm saying? And so the Lord says, okay, leave it alone. Every now and then, he'd say, okay, throw a little something out. And I'd throw it out, and he'd say, no, I'm not here to become a Christian. I'm here to practice my English. Okay, beer, no problem. By the end of the week, I wish I could say, beer got saved. But he didn't. And as I'm leaving, I told him, I said, I've really enjoyed hanging out with you this week, and I'm afraid that I'll never see you again. Would you make me a promise that you'll come and hear me preach one more time? I'm going to be preaching at a church in Bangkok called Takaset Church, and I want you to come, if you can, to this church, Takaset Church in Bangkok. I'm going to preach there on Sunday morning, and then I'm going right to the airport and flying back to America. He goes, I live in Bangkok. I go, do you know where Takaset Church is? He says, I do. I said, would you promise me that you'll come hear me one more time? He said, I make you a promise. So that Sunday, I was sitting down front like I always do, checking the door, and 15 minutes of church goes by and beer hadn't showed up. Then all of a sudden, 15 minutes after church starts, he comes in the back door. So I quickly jump up. I go sit in the back with him on the back row. And I said, beer, I don't know what they're saying. I don't preach till the end of the service. And so between now and then, would you please translate for me what they're saying? What are they singing? What are they saying? And so he now is repeating all of the words to the songs for me. He's preaching the gospel to himself as he's repeating it to me. They take the Lord's Supper. They took the Lord's Supper. They did it every week at this church. I acted like I had never seen it before. And I was like, what are they doing? What, what is that? Explain. Oh, it goes, oh, they're, they're, they're eating this bread and it represents the broken body of Jesus for our sins. And they're taking this cup and it represents the blood of Jesus. I was like, man, that's awesome. Tell me more. You know? And so he's preaching to me the whole service. Now, time comes for me to preach and I get it from the back row. I come up to the front and with a translator, I preach my message. And I wish I could tell you that beer walks the aisle, but he doesn't. He grabs me on the way out the door, though, and he says, can I have your email address? He goes, I want to continue practicing my English via email. I said, sure. And so he and I would email for a while, and then about a month or two afterwards, he's writing to me, and he's writing in such a way, it seems like he's a Christian. So I quickly sent an email, and I said, Beer, did you become a Christian? This is what he wrote back. He said, Pastor Jim, I'm sorry for not telling you that I have become a Christian already. I decided to give my life to Jesus just a month after you had left Thailand then. I'm sorry that I didn't keep in touch with you due to my busy study. Actually, I was thinking of writing an email to tell you that I was reborn, but I was stuck with such many things that I forgot to tell you. Now, honestly, after you had left here, I keep going to the church every Sunday wondering and protesting. Anyway, I became more and more open to Christ. And one day, I believe God is real suddenly after seeing a woman healed from crippled. All I want to do is saying thank you for putting me in the right way of God. If it wasn't because of our promise to meet again at Takas at church, I wouldn't have tried to go join the church and got such a new life. Hope to see you again, Chris. Isn't that awesome? I went to Thailand to preach and teach to pastors. 
I did not go there to share the gospel with someone whose email address was lethal calamity. (laughs) But as I walk with Jesus, he sets up appointments I could have never dreamed. Folks, stop making evangelism your focus and make Jesus your focus. Follow me, he said. I'll set your appointments. Would you stand as we pray? Father, as we have begun this journey this weekend, and it's already begun. This is a reteaching. This is a John 21 more than a Luke 5. Maybe for some in here today, this is a Luke 5 moment where they're coming to know who you are for the first time. But Lord, for many of us in this room, this is a John 21 time where you're having to reteach us how to follow you. And Lord, we have only begun looking at the many ways in which we have taken over the church. We stop following you. And it's become our church instead of your church. And our plan and our strategy and what we want, Lord, I pray that we would begin the journey of allowing you to show each of us what we're holding on to so that we can lay it down and hear from you and become followers of you. And then you get to do in this place and through these people whatever you have in mind. May we not have in our mind what it's going to look like. You're going to show us this week that you get to determine what it looks like. Lord, in that passage in John 21, after the time of eating the fish, you took uh, Peter on a little walk and showed him how he was going to die. and You told him to just feed your sheep. And follow you. Of course, being a human, he got caught up into, what about John? How's he going to die? And you had to remind him, you follow me. You leave my plan for John alone, and you follow me. Father, as you put us together, take our eyes off of each other more and more. And may they become more and more focused on you, so that your purposes and your plans would be accomplished. We pray this in Jesus' name.